Hello, everyone. So welcome to this panel. Uh, let me just start right away. I think the best would be if everyone would uh, introduce themselves only shortly, uh, one line, and then we can jump straight into the questions. Uh, maybe, Amir, can you take it? Yes, uh, my name is Amir. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of Xerox Labs, uh, and we build all sorts of different decentralized exchange infrastructure, uh, including uh, a liquidity aggregator uh, and a request for quote system. Uh, Stefan. Hey everyone, um, I'm Stefan. I am a founder and a current steward at Flashbot. Um, we uh, build all kinds of technologies that help uh, blockchains deal with NEV. Awesome. Uh, hi, Felix. Hi, uh, I'm Felix. I'm with Gnosis at the moment. Um, at Gnosis, we've built a decentralized exchange protocol, uh, which we call CowSwap. Um, it is based on uh, batched auctions and um, multi-dimensional order books. We're trying to minimize the amount of MEV that is inherent to existing decentralized exchange protocols and are um, also planning to take a CowSwap solo and, and spinning the project out of, um, of Gnosis. And yeah, I've been um, leading the technical development on this project. Thank you. And the last speaker is Deli Gong. Hi, uh, yeah, this is Deli. I'm the co-founder of Automata Network. Uh, so we are building decentralized uh, middlewares uh, that focus on privacy for all kinds of DApps across many layer one and layer two platforms. So uh, our uh, our solution, one of the solutions is called uh, Convir, which is trying to uh, minimize MEV on um, many layer one and layer two as well. It's an application specific, uh, it's an application level solution in compared to so, so many blockchain level solutions, yeah. Thank you, Deli. Uh, and I have the honor to host this panel. I'm Peter Chris, co-founder of Mangata Finance. Mangata is an application specific blockchain focused on the decentralized exchange where mempool is encrypted and reordering powers are prevented. It's a parachain in the Polkadot ecosystem. Let me just jump right in into the hot topic of these days. So what is the problem with arbitrages lately? As far as I remember, they were good and necessary for the blockchain to be efficient, but now arbitrations are seen as exploitative. Uh, what, what, what are the arguments uh, in this area? Maybe Stefan? Sure. Um, I think it's a nuanced topic. So um, I don't think it's possible to go out and say all arbitrage is uh, exploitative. Though I do want to push back against the concept that arbitrage as we see it today in the DeFi ecosystem um, has a purely positive impact to the end users. Um, I think there is a tremendous amount of value that's being captured by a small number of actors through um, um, through this process. And this value is being taken directly away from uh, users in one way or another by giving them usually worse price execution on, um, on the execution of their transactions. Um, so yeah, um, I think it's important for the... Um, the ecosystem to have a conversation around like what is the role of arbitrage um, uh, bots and um, are they actually uh, providing a uh, benefit to the users um, uh, or are there other designs that are able to uh, provide better value uh, for the uh, for the users that are executing against these uh, these exchanges any follow-up Amir I think you maybe wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I uh, generally agree with uh, Stefan. I don't think arbitrage is inherently bad, but uh, there are certain ways in which it, it can be used that are just purely extractive of users. I mean, you know, like a sandwich attack, for example, you're, you're basically manipulating a market to, uh, you know, almost steal money from, from a user 
uh, in uh, a risk-free way. I think that's obviously not, not really good for anyone. Um, and then uh, another issue uh, that I think is not very well known or, or talked about uh, is that uh, the amount of arbitrage on chain causes this problem where if a user is trading against an automated market maker and they see a quoted price uh, you know, on a front end, uh, generally by the time that that trade is actually executed and hits a blockchain, um, they're not actually going to realize that quoted price. On, on average, they will be realizing a price, you know, probably like 10 basis points worse than, than what they're shown. So, you know, that that is not, that doesn't happen intentionally uh, necessarily, but, you know, in some ways it is also deceiving uh, to users. Uh, so those are those are kind of the two uh, main issues that that I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps I can also chip in a bit. Um, so I uh, yeah I, I also think that uh, this arbitrage is actually sometimes healthy for the system because I actually bring it helps with the liquidity and also the uh, price discovery for for taxes particularly. Uh, but but I feel that it's just that the uh, the, the underlying uh, execution engine, which is a blockchain itself, uh, is uh, it's supposed to provide actually a fair manner for all the participants. Uh, but now nowadays, it just uh, it 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 provides some benefits or advantages to some of the participants, which is uh, which are the bots and also the miners, uh, which they, they look unfair actually to the users because they don't have they, they normally don't have the knowledge to run this kind of. Uh, uh, sophisticated strategies to in order to arbitrage other people. So, so yeah, in that sense, uh, I guess uh, all the blockchain layers should should should, should try to solve these issues uh, once once for all. Yeah. I would jump into the cross chain domain uh, right now. Do you see any fundamental difference? between MEV on layer one and MEV on layer two? Anyone? Maybe, I mean, fundamentally, I, I would say I, I don't see a difference in the type of MEV that exists um, between these layers, um, but happy to discuss this as well. Um, I think one thing that um, might make at least some of the layer twos we see today with um, also a different consensus mechanism uh, more uh, well kind of uh, targeted for MEV is that at least in the past miners have been very good at understanding kind of the economies of mining and getting cheap electronics and cheap um, energy to, to perform the mining job but they have not necessarily been super engaged with the community and ecosystem um, as a whole. Um, I think MEV, uh, Geth and Flashbots have kind of you know, seen this, this gap between kind of the um, DeFi native searchers who actually understand MEV and find strategies to extract the MEV and the miners who are actually in the power of proposing these blocks and build a bridge for this. But I would see that in a lot of layer twos and specifically with proof of stake, kind of um, the this gap between um, kind of, yeah, blockchain specific, like blockchain natives who understand everything quite specifically and people that are just in the business of providing a, a service that requires hardware and cheap energy um, makes MEV attraction kind of um, more um, plausible or more, yeah, likely. Well, I know that validators are maximizing uh, their MEV game, for instance, on, on Solana. So like, are you saying that proof of stake validators have more resources to invest in MEV research compared to proof of work miners? Is there any uh, difference in how, how those two consensus mechanisms are compared in, in MEV? I mean, fundamentally, the MEV exists in both uh, systems. Uh, I would say just from the, the background of people that tend to become validators in uh, proof of stake systems tend to be maybe more aligned with the uh, background of people that actually understand MEV and can extract it. Whereas in proof of work, um, I feel the, the, the type of um, uh, companies and, and people that run nodes 
might be a bit more uh, disjunct from the, the people that actually understand the movie um, quite specifically. I think another thing in proof of stake uh, that that can make things uh, different is that you have a certain, you have a little bit more of a um, foresight into who gets to propose a block. Um, so it's not necessarily completely random uh, for every given block. And so that may have some impact on the types of MEVs and kind of the, the communication um, foresight you have with, um, with potential researchers or if you're a researcher yourself. Um, to uh, come up with a strategy. Any follow up to that? So fundamentally, miners have power to reorder, reject, or insert transactions. Um, if we're talking about layer twos uh, where there are sequencers, uh, do sequencers have fundamentally the same powers or will the game somehow change when we are comparing now layer one and layer two? Yeah, so um, if we look strictly at reordering transaction inclusion and, and censorship of transactions, um, sequencer have all of these powers. So one way to think about uh, like the powers that layer twos have uh, with regards to this type of MEV is to think of uh, the equivalent if Ethereum only had a single miner um, and that single miner was producing every single block and they were able to uh, include whatever transactions they want, exclude whatever transactions they want and reorder transactions. That's sort of how um, layer twos are, are designed today. Um, you know, there's different types of MEVs that are, that are uh, specific to the consensus mechanisms and the ordering rules of the protocols. Um, so um, in theory, you could have different systems that have different properties, um, but I don't know that there are any LA 2s right now that, uh, that don't operate with this single sequencer model. So for instance, uh, on most of the chains that are low fees or chains that are just young enough to not be congested, um, there is usually an obvious problem with, with spamming tactics. Uh, those spamming tactics can get really sophisticated. Um, do you think that the spamming game would change on layer two with sequencers in place or does it even make sense given that L2s are much more performant? I can, I can yeah, try to touch on this right now as well. I think the way that these layer twos currently work, again, caveat, like there's a huge design space and, and the way ordering rules are implemented, but the way they currently work is a single sequencer model with a sort of first come first serve or receive time ordering system where whenever the sequencer receives a transaction from, um, from user, uh, then it attempts to include it as is. Um, it seems like these are sort of the rules that the layer two implementation teams are running with to try to provide sort of um, uh, the simplest, uh, most user-friendly implementation. Um, but it has some uh, externalities, which is that it does not deal with uh, MEV, it sort of ignores it. Um, and makes possible strategies like spam and like collocation uh, possible. Um, so in, in this world, um, in order to be able to benefit from, from MEV extraction, yes, you can, you can definitely um, uh, perform uh, spam strategies um, so long as the fees on the network are, are low enough um, and you are clearly incentivized to collocate the strategies that you're running as a bot operator with, uh, with the sequencers to be able to uh, get minimum uh, latency on execution. Can you describe one of the spam strategies? I'm, I'm actually not uh, too familiar. Yeah, so it would work something like this. You have um, like the execution for your arbitrage uh, between like multiple pools, um, uh, like the code for the, the routing or the execution of it baked into the smart contract. And then you just like spam the same call data to it uh, all the time. Uh, and you just do like an early revert 
if the like arbitrage doesn't exist and then it only goes through if the arbitrage exists so you like have some on-chain computation cost to check if the arbitrage exists uh, but if you sort of uh, are able to execute this on a low fee chain then um, you're able to uh, get some significant advantage um, we've seen a lot of this on uh, for example avalanche and uh, polygon as being like very effective strategies when the the fees were still relatively low um, and then gradually over time on these networks, the like competitive advantage has shifted to the collocation and, and latency or, uh, advantages. Gotcha, thank you. That's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, and just want to know, uh, is there any anti-spam strategy that these uh, sequencers can, can use just to, to identify those spammers basically from their uh, behaviors or their patterns over the transactions? I don't know. I mean, you could always try to do like behavior analysis and try to like de-anonymize addresses, uh, but that's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, I don't know that everyone wants to be sending all their transactions through a ne neural net to try to classify them before they execute them. So I think probably um, the best way that like the like networks deal with this is their chain starts to get um uh, uh resource constrained right uh, gas prices or just including prices go up and then that makes like spam strategies less likely um but yeah it doesn't uh increase the number of different actors who are able to sort of participate in this it just uh makes it such that um the actors instead of investing in um in spam um or in like uh execution costs they invest in um, hardware costs and like co-location costs. Um, so um, it, it, it shifts over, I guess, the, the equilibrium of what the most uh, successful strategy is. Yeah, got it, thanks. Uh, this this uh, environment leads me to, to a question whether it makes sense for uh, sequencers to be the same as searchers on flashbots. So, uh, when when there are when there is a settlement of L two batches on L one, would it make sense to that go through the flashbots auction? I I think it's sort of a separate question. So, when 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 I think about layer two MEV, I think there's there's two things to think about. There's the MEV from the uh, sort of execution of transactions within this L2 chain, right? Within that um, that that um, that sort of state, um, and then there's the separate task of the L2 to settle those uh, those state transitions as the roll up back to the, the main chain. Um, We've looked at this a bit at Flashbots and and Alex Obadia, who who's on the on the Flashbots research team, um, and knows a lot about this. But um, the current uh, impression that we have is that there really is not much MEV from the settling of rollups on main chain. Um, the uh, they are large transactions that like require a lot of uh, resources on on ETH layer one. Uh, but uh, the only really thing that a miner could do is uh, delay the settlement by like a few blocks. And that doesn't really meaningfully impact the, um, uh, the experience of the, uh, of the, of the rollup and is quite costly. Um, and then reorgs as well uh, don't seem to have much of an impact. They can just uh, resubmit the transactions or whatever and, and, and get it included at a later point in time. So, so any form of sort of censorship is like quite costly and doesn't have a clear economic benefit. So it's, it's unlikely to be a, a strategy, um, which means that, yeah, for, uh, for these rollout op operators, there isn't much of a benefit to routing through something like Flashbots. What they really want to be able to get is um, uh, sort of uh, inclusion at the lowest possible cost, which I guess is, is what everyone else in Ethereum wants right now. Is, is it possible that it's actually, it, it could actually be advantageous for uh, sequencers to take advantage of 
MVP opportunities themselves and you know act as searchers um, in order to like prevent spam and co-location and stuff like that because you know there would essentially be no incentive for anyone else to even attempt to take advantage of of MEV if they knew that the sequencer was taking all the opportunities themselves. Isn't that a bit like if uh, if like stock exchanges were in the in the business of high frequency trading themselves? Like I think it may might be advantageous for the chains as well to kind of separate these concerns and sell the co-location as like an extra revenue stream to people that are actually you know really experts in the the topic. That's true. I, I guess what I had in mind is you know maybe sequencer captures the value and redistributes redistributes it to token holders somehow or something like that. Um, I, you know, I guess the Flashbots positions being quite um, uh, big fans of, of this idea. Um, I think, you know, what Felix brought up about um, separation of concern is a good one, which is like, do we do we want all the layer twos to be investing in trading ter teams to be able to extract all the MEV? Um, I think that's not probably the, like the most efficient way to go about it. Um, uh, we're big fans of inserting sort of a, a market mechanism here or an auction to be able to auction off the rights to do the ordering, which has this sort of same economic impact where the MEV does get extracted, it removes the latency advantage, it removes this, the spam, it makes sure that anyone can participate and it's sort of a permissionless competition. Um, uh, and then yes, the, the funds that are raised can be used for, for I guess, whatever that layer two uh, wants to design whether it's uh, funding public good, whether it's sum submitting it back to, to the token holders through some kind of buyback and burn. Um, th there's probably multiple uh, different designs uh, for, for what to do at that point. Felix, I, I know uh, you've been mentioning uh, on Twitter, like how can an interchain batch auction look like? Uh, can you maybe describe like how that how that could work? Yeah, um, I mean, so fundamentally, maybe uh, the the way that batch auctions work is that in, uh, instead of settling each trade um, individually against kind of the best liquidity on chain or against whatever uh, market maker quotes individually for this order, we actually collect multiple user orders over time um, into an order book that potentially can be overlapping because, um, well, if somebody wants to sell Ether at 4,500 and somebody wants to buy Ether at a price of up to um, $5,000, then there is kind of an overlap in this in this order book. Uh, so just like from a perspective, how, how batch auctions are different to kind of these continuous style order books. And now uh, just on a conceptual level to do this uh, across multiple chains would just mean that the uh, orders that we collect and the, the places in which these orders eventually end up uh, getting settled would not just be um, entirely um, happening on, on a single on a single layer or on a single chain. And of course, the challenge uh, with doing so is the lack of atomicity between different chains. So if we're trying to, for example, settle somebody selling ETH on uh, layer one Ethereum and somebody buying ETH uh, on, on Polygon, for example, uh, it might happen that uh, the settlement now needs kind of two transactions and the transaction on, on Ethereum might go through and the transaction on Polygon might revert. So kind of having this, atom achieving kind of a, a settlement guarantee or atomicity across uh, different layers is kind of the, the main challenge here. Uh, not so much actually just creating a, a batch and settling it kind of theoretically. And so we are still very early in the in the design phase there, um, but uh, one idea that we're having specifically on how to, for example, connect uh, layer one liquidity and um, right now we're deployed on XDAI as a layer two or sidechain, not really layer two, um, is to basically have the, the cow swap settlement contract act a little bit as like a bridge. So what people can do, there would be like the, the, the main kind of source of truth chain, which of course, from our perspective would be um, the Ethereum mainnet contract uh, where people could deposit funds into um, the CowSwap settlement contract. And those funds could then be used to mint tokens on uh, other layer twos. So you could envision 
uh, the settlement contract acting as a bridge into Polygon, acting as a bridge into XTime, whatever other side chain you're, you're looking at. And then we can use the balances that are stored in the bridge to actually make sure that um, we have a certain kind of atomicity or at least certain guarantees that funds are not moved around from either side of the bridge while the user is trying to make a trade. So if you wanted to trade you, um, well, on mainnet, you would probably not lock it because that's working quite well at the moment. Like you can have one chain that is, that is basically your source of truth and where you don't really uh, need to have some, some locking guarantees. But then on the cheap uh, layer, uh, to our side chains, you, you would, whenever you wanted to make a trade, basically make that capital, lock that capital in, in a place where it, where it kind of is safe and, and, and can be can be executed or used by the, the solvers or the, the infrastructure that's actually performing the trades. And then you're no longer bound on kind of having different execution speeds. You can actually make sure that uh, trades either go through or don't go through kind of in lockstep. It still becomes a bit more challenging if you're trying to access liquidity on those side chains that you don't control. So, for example, if there's an AMM on Polygon that you want to use for a trade on mainnet, um, there again you might have a bit of more uh, probabilistic approaches and not this this lockstep guarantee. Um, and we're kind of researching more into how we can uh, make this kind of the the external, not intrinsic to our batch auction liquidity available as well. Um, but kind of yeah, the general idea would be to have um, the a bridge contract that also acts as kind of a, yeah, a settlement engine and, um, and decentralized exchange at the center. Thank you, uh, Dili. Um, do you see a privacy? How, how would privacy change uh, these dynamics between different domains? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of privacy, uh, um, if, if you look the, from a different angle of, uh, of this MEV, it's actually uh, it's about the transaction information uh, got leaked before it got executed on, on the engine, on the uh, DEX or other DApps. So we, we could actually potentially patch this loophole by just setting up, a, setting up a channel where the information is not revealed until the transaction ordering is decided and becomes immutable. Uh, so our approach is actually ended up quite simple. So user could just send a meta transaction via a relayer that's running in a trusted execution environment. So uh, the relayer will just decide uh, the ordering without any bias. So uh, a simple way is to just maybe use first come first serve ordering, but there, there might be other ways um, that depend on the, uh, uh, which, which approach DEX want to use. And due to the use of this uh, trusted execution environment or TEE, the relayers will not be able to reorder the transactions uh, or deny any transactions. And when the transactions leave those relayers uh, and being forward to blockchain, uh, miners and validators are not able to manipulate them anymore because uh, the meta transaction ordering is already kind of locked in by the relayers. So no one can change it anymore. So it, it, in a sense that it creates a, a kind of a local ordering that's particular to that D app or even a particular my, uh, trading pool as totally possible. And it became quite uh, lightweight uh, and also works across uh, many layer one, layer two as well. Uh, so if, if, we, if, if compare this to uh, maybe the searchers or the solvers, uh, so the huge difference is actually this only safeguards the uh, kind of the uh, per app local ordering um, and other than the uh, kind of the global ordering for the entire chain or the entire layer two, yeah. I think one of the like biggest or ultimate uh, rejections or value extractions by rejection um, is when there is an arbitrage opportunity and the relayer, despite the transactions being encrypted, the relayer can basically reject all the transactions and replace it when, with one transaction that is um, exploiting or like filling up the, the arbitrage. So despite the, the enhanced privacy, do you see any, any approach to uh, this kind of uh, problem? Yeah, I guess the uh, first thing is because uh, users will have a kind of end-to-end -end encryption channel towards those relayers. So, uh, so only a strategy that a relayer can take is actually just blindly just deny all the transactions or randomly deny the transactions. Which, which sometimes might not be very efficient to execute their strategy sometimes. And also that will damage their reputation as well because uh, in this uh, kind of trusted execution environment setup, those identities of the uh, relayers are known. So 
if a particular relay is just behaving uh, abnormally, people could know it and just avoid it in the future. For example, if I can choose to connect to different endpoints, that, that's uh, set it up by different uh, relayers. There's, there will always be, uh, I, I would say, the, the good or benign relayers that are there. And also this PE technology could help with that because it, it definitely separate the, uh, the uh, relayer engine itself from the, uh, the actual operating system or hardware that's running it. If I understood the question correct, Peter, you were asking if, so basically, if let's say a background opportunity would be created, then with this technology, it's impossible for the relayer to kind of extract or for an arbitrageur to extract that backgrounding opportunity within the block itself. But wouldn't it just uh, postpone that opportunity to the top slot of the next block and the relayer, even though they don't know what other transactions are coming in, they could still make sure that them or a party that they're working with get that first slot in the in the pool and basically in the block and basically just execute whatever arbitrage opportunity was created before immediately in the first slot of the next block yeah that, that could be possible that's, that sounds quite interesting actually yeah. well one of the more controversial things that happened uh, i believe two months ago was that Ethermine uh, pool rejected transactions that uh, that were clearly front running. Um, it was possible, it was because uh, some legal compliance reasons. Uh, so maybe that's, that's a question for the future. Uh, if MEV will be legally troublesome, uh, do you think that the MEV will be mitigated just because of the compliance reasons? Yeah, I feel it's it's possible because uh, in the future, if some just big part, big uh, players are running this, uh, I mean the layer two nodes, they are they, they maybe they have to just care about their reputations in the entire space. So they, they tend to not doing this kind of uh, uh, MEV uh, attacks uh, because all the records will be public on chain. No, everyone can just check and track if uh, this particular party is doing uh, MEV against users or not. Yeah, I feel that's that's possible in the future. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It, it seems like a pretty likely outcome to me. Um, that being said, I, I don't think, you know, anyone's going to regulate away 100% of MEV. I think it would probably be just the MEV that's very targeted towards users. But like general arbitrage opportunities or like, you know, the last example uh, Felix mentioned uh, where, you know, the... The, the, the blockchain is in you know some some state that can be arbitraged and you know a miner wants to get the, the very first transaction in that block that's not inherently bad for like a specific user i think something like that is difficult to regulate away but i would not be surprised if you know five ten years from now there is like actual regulation that like prevents miners uh from like specifically front running or sandwiching users one problem, however, is that if we don't reduce the amount of MEV that is inherent to um, the network, then this MEV might not be taken by the miners, but uh, we will go back to the state that we had before Flashbots came along, where um, certain right, people will just um, spam the network probabilistically and cause even more negative um, externalities by uh, wasting black, the block space with, with failing transactions that drive up the costs for everyone that is not even related to this trade or sandwiching attack. So I, I wonder if like in a completely trustless network, uh, in the presence of MEV, even if miners agree to not extract it themselves, uh, it will be possible to prevent kind of you know, the, the old school one and a half years ago way of um, extracting MEVs. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I don't think there's an easy All answer. Right. <laughs> so this is a super, super nuanced topic. Um, I think, the main uh, position that, that I have in this is to be very careful not to solve a technical problem with a regulatory solution um, because regulatory solutions are very big hammers that uh, strike a lot of the things at once. Um, and if you look at uh, what like regulating away um, front running or, or sandwiching looks like, it's um, uh, solving MEV through uh, compelled censorship. 
Um, it is about uh, putting some restrictions on actors on the network in the way that uh, they are able to select and, and include transactions um, and is by default sort of taking away the credible neutrality um, that uh, a lot of these systems depend on. Um, and so um, I think this is sort of a massive threat to, um, to the way that the systems work today and the way that they're able to continue uh, working in a um, in a sort of trust minimized manner um, to, uh, to, to have the possibility of such, um, of such uh, limitations being, being introduced. Um, and so uh, uh, when I say that this is um, uh, likely to be uh, solved through technical problems, I do think that natural uh, market forces are going to eliminate all of the um, user costs uh, from uh, from front running and 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 sandwiching, uh, just through the development of of systems that uh, create less um, uh, uh, or, or create more benefit for for the users, um, and and le le uh, leaving users the choice to use systems that create more value for them is going to naturally uh, eliminate uh, uh, these um, uh, these characteristics. When we're talking about costs for the for the users, um, do you think that MEV affect gas prices positively or negatively? What what's the future outlook on that? Anyone? I can I, I can riff on this. Um, I think MEV enables a lot of new um, experiments with um, with gas prices. So um, just looking at Ethereum specifically uh, for pre-London uh, hard fork, right? All of a sudden MEV sort of made it possible to provide a user experience of, um, of, of zero gas price. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, um, uh, the uh, zero X team has been able to replicate also in the, in the post um, uh, EIP 1559 uh, world. Um, uh, but uh, it sort of enables to move around the way that uh, users experience paying for the inclusion of their transactions on the system from um, uh, being sort of an upfront fee uh, for inclusion to being sort of a, a baked in fee, somewhat similar to how uh, uh, Robinhood works. Um, so that's one way to like think about uh, the impact of MEV on gas fees. Um, you could imagine like a, a layer two system or or some 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 other chain that says like all the transactions on a chain is free, um, and uh, the way that you pay for inclusion is just through uh, through MEV. Um, uh, it could be uh, some 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 new experiments to see. Um, I think separately, uh, one can think of of the impact of MEV as the gas price experienced by the average user. Um, and what we've seen here is that in periods of high MEV, let's say that there's uh, a particularly restricted uh, opportunity on chain. So like a, a token drop or an NFT drop um, where all the bots all of a sudden for a period of, of several blocks are competing on spamming the chain to try to be the first one to, to receive that opportunity. Um, like we've seen with many of the first come first, first serve sales. Um, uh, the impact is that you clutter the chain with a bunch of, um, of reverting transactions, um, which uh, puts a um, uh, sort of a upward price pressure on the, on the gas prices, uh, which are experienced by everyone else in the network who's trying to do sort of regular activity. Um, so mishandling and misdesigning the way that the protocol handles MEV certainly has an impact on the, uh, the average gas price experience by, by all the users of the platform. Any follow up on that? Maybe just um, like I totally agree with with, with what Stefan said. Um, uh, also, the idea of baking in gas prices into into prices from the user perspective. I mean, that's also uh, how Cosworp works. You, you're not paying um, any gas for for su submitting your order. You're only paying part of your sell token when the order gets submitted. However, this is kind of from a user perspective. It's very you know it looks like gas prices are affected, but just from a global level, gas prices are 
um, the cost of inclusion into a um, well, scarce computational resource blockchain and the presence of MEV kind of makes the demand for this inclusion overall larger and also totally agree with Stefan that if MEV is handled incorrectly, the spike can be even higher. So designing for MEV in your protocol can make this extra demand um, lower, but just generally speaking, the, the presence of MEV, presence of arbitrage opportunity just increases demand for, for block space and therefore would, I would say overall increases the gas price, no matter how that is then kind of abstracted away and presented to the user. Thank you. Uh, we are coming slowly to the to the end of uh, of the session. Uh, the the last question that I would ask, uh, it's a very very broad one. Uh, by which attribute the fairness should be assessed? Like the the fair blockchain. What what does it what does it mean? Is it equal access to opportunity to arbitrage? Is that uh, equal latency? Um, how how MEV democratization uh, looks like in, in this area? Anyone? I can go, maybe I could go first. I, I would personally would like to take, like fairness is, I think there was also this great um, thread by Robert Miller about how fairness is a super subjective question or criterion. I think um, a lot of systems in the real or also traditional finance world are designed not necessarily, or one other question you could ask, what makes the market most efficient? And you could hope that the most efficient market also kind of coincides with the most fair market. Um, and for me personally, I'm a strong believer that kind of these low level latency wars and co-location and first come first serve um, at the mercy of like one nanosecond before somebody else makes gives you the right to be executed for that other person doesn't make the market more efficient. And so that's why I personally think that, well, um, at least for maybe 15 seconds, uh, Ethereum block time is too long um, for kind of saying everything is kind of in the same, everything happened at once, but, um, you know, breaking this continuum of time into discrete epochs of maybe a second or five seconds. Uh, for me is a reasonable way of uh, preventing these kind of high frequency and uh, arms race for hardware and co-location wars uh, at the cost of um, not making the market more efficient and at the cost of basically uh, negative externalities for the users. So yeah, in, in my perspective, if people you know uh, express the same intent to trade within the same second, they should not uh, receive a different price for, for, um, for that intent. I can uh, I can offer my, my perspective on fairness. I think fairness is um, maximizing user choice and minimizing barriers to entry. Um, and I think that if those two properties are um, are present in in a system, um, the most fair outcome will emerge just through uh, uh, market activity. Yeah, and maybe a different angle is uh, uh, what what fairness not uh, that not means. Uh, so, I guess the uh, manip manipulation is something that we don't want. So, I guess this is something we don't we, we don't really need in, in the fairness world. And then uh, maybe some just very clear attacks. For example, if uh, some if someone can be defined as victim in a in a certain MEV incident, then I guess this kind of MEV is not not something good to have. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Um, it was an awesome session. We're already on time. Um, I would hope we would have two more hours to talk about this, but hopefully we were able to go through uh, all the uh, diverse topics in, uh, in MEV. Uh, thank you very much again for, for your time and uh, have a nice day. Thanks, Peter, thank for moderating. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.